you join us on the outskirts of Beijing in rather nice countryside on a misty day. Obviously with the ongoing restrictions, Tom could not make it to China, but we're here today to experience the new Xpeng P5. This is the crucial third model from Xiaopeng. As you may know, Xpeng is one of three companies listed in the US, the others being Neo and Li Auto. Crucially, this is the world's first production car to feature LiDAR. For some time now, we've been seeing a lot of cars with LiDAR sensors mounted on them, all test cars. And usually they have a big rig up here with the sensors or big protrusions from the sides. And I've always wondered, I'm sure a lot of people have, how is this actually going to make it into production? Well, currently there seem to be two different methods. Firstly, you have cars like Neo ET7, which mount them in the roof at the top. However, Xpeng have gone a different route. What they have done is mounted them in the fender here. Crucially though, note it is set back from the front. So I was speaking to Eric Joe, the designer of Xpeng earlier this year, and he said that they've actually tried to make this a sort of integral part of the car. So it's like an aggressive feature such as a teeth or claws. One crucial point is if you look at the Arc Fox Alpha S, the Huawei Inside version, they have three LiDAR sensors, whereas Xpeng has two. However, with the Arc Fox, it actually has a LiDAR sensor right in the middle here. Now, you might think, okay, yeah, three LiDAR sensors is probably gonna be better, but there's one huge problem. In the slightest accident you have, that LiDAR sensor is going to be destroyed. And currently, a LiDAR sensor is somewhere in the region of 1,500 US dollars. So it's quite an expensive accident, even in the smallest little prang. Here we have the LiDAR unit. So as I mentioned, this is gonna be the first production car in the world to actually feature LiDAR. This car goes on sale officially on September the 15th with deliveries beginning at the end of October. In the next year, there are actually four cars in China that I know of with LiDAR being launched. The others being the Neo ET7, the Weltmeister W7, the Arc Fox Alpha S Huawei Inside, and finally the IML7. We don't know what all the prices are of those cars, but what I can tell you is of the cars, um, the prices that we do know of, all of them are at least 50% more expensive than the P5. Also in the US um, launching, there will be the Lucid Air. Crucially, this LiDAR allows the P5 to have what is known as X-Pilot 3.5. If you've seen our videos of the P7, you'll notice that the P7 has what's known as X-Pilot 3.0. Now, Xpilot 3.0 introduced NGP, Navigation Guided Pilot. Currently, NGP only works on highways and certain limited inner city roads, which are kind of protected. The LiDAR adds to the suite of sensors that the P7 has. So that is 12 ultrasonic sensors, five millimeter wavelength radars, and around 13 cameras. Crucially, what this allows it to do is to drive on pretty much most city roads. So there'll be a function occurring um, probably around about the end of this year, maybe early next year, called City NGP. And this will be able to drive the car in a self-driving function on most inner city roads. Xpeng have two platforms, known as David and Edward. Currently, Xpeng have two models on the market the G3 and the P7. G3 is on the David platform, whereas the P7 is on the Edward platform. With the P5, this is also based on the David platform. It has a wheelbase of 2,768 millimeters. Now, if you're familiar with the G3, the G3 is actually a smallish crossover SUV type car. This, however, is really quite a large sedan. Although this is meant to be a compact car, size-wise it's actually far closer to the P7. So despite the wheelbase being 200 millimeters less 
than the P7. Actually, its length is really quite close. So the length of this car is 4,808 millimeters. That's 72 millimeters only less than the P7. So it's really quite a big car. And what Xpeng have done is try to get the most out of the wheelbase and out of its size. As we'll see, the capacity inside is really quite spacious. First impression of the P5's interior is that it seems that Xpeng has matured. If you compare it to the interior of, say, the earlier G3 or the P7, it seems that everything is just more finished and more mature. So you've got good use of high quality material. So you've got soft touch plastics, you've got a nice sort of metal finish here. Everything seems very well put together. You've got various features like a camera here. You've got speakers that rise up. Crucial, however, to the layout of the dashboard are these two screens. You've got a 12.3 inch instrument panel and a 15.6 inch infotainment screen. If you compare though the placing to the previous models, with the P7 you had really one large expanse of glass. Okay, it was two individual screens, but they blended into one another. This though takes the G3 approach where there are two separate screens. However, there is one key difference to the G3. The G3 screen kind of protrudes up above the dashboard and looks almost like it's an afterthought and just stuck on. This is far better integrated into the overall layout. You have also other features such as a wireless charging point here. And this has actually been reconfigured from how it is in the P7 and it drops right down there and it's a useful, useful space. One important aspect obviously with Xpeng cars are that they're smart connected vehicles. And so the infotainment system is really quite important with Xpeng. And this is a page which gives information about the car. So we've got the different um, drive modes here. So at the moment, the car is set in sports mode. We've got an eco mode and we've got a normal mode. We've got um, headlight controls there. And we can um, make various alterations such as whether it's high, medium or low with the regenerative braking. And one thing actually I should mention is the regenerative braking on the P5 is relatively strong on the higher setting. Let's go off the screen. We've got a map here. We've got various music options. And remember, a lot of these things are actually operated, can be operated, I should say, by voice control. Underlying the operations of this car, um, so we've got a 360 degree up view. Well, actually, we've got a rear view right now, but we can put that into 360 degrees. And we can also put that into a 3D view. So running this system is the third generation Snapdragon 8155 chip, which replaced the 820A in the P7. So it should give a much smoother operating process and be much quicker to operate. One slightly bad point about it is it's actually only 4G whereas some Chinese cars are actually using 5G, which I find a little bit strange actually why Xpeng stuck with 4G, but I'm sure they have a reason of some sort. Here we are in the back of the P5, and if there's one thing that's really noticeable about it is how much space there is. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of legroom. What Xpeng has done is really managed to maximize the use of the wheelbase to give as much room as possible to the occupants and where it really shows is here in the back seat. Now there are also some interesting features. Um, oh, uh, one thing I should mention, we actually have quite good headspace as well. So it's not just leg room. I'm about five foot 975 centimeters and I've got a ha hand's width between my head and the top of the roof. We also have a 1.5 or nearly 1.5 meter squared panoramic roof. And there are a few other features which are quite nifty as well. So if we pull down the um, armrest, we've got obviously the cup holders in there. But have a look at this. It 
So in there we have a fridge, complete with some nicely chilled coffee. So there is enough space in here for probably about three bottles. Has a nice little closing action there. I should point out that this is an optional extra, so it is not actually included on the top of the range, but can be purchased for an extra amount of money, as can a projector, which would be mounted up here. And there is actually a 12 volt power outlet here, which you would use for the projector. And along with the projector comes a roll out screen. So the screen will roll down in the front and then you can project a movie. There is another feature actually about the space in here as well. You can actually put the front seats down so they act, so they go pretty much flat for what's known as sleep mode. And what's more, Xbox actually has another accessory, which is like an airbed that you can pump up, probably use, using the uh, 12 volt outlet there, and it inflates, and then you can have a nice um, space where you can lie down and watch your movie being projected onto the front screen. We're now in the passenger seat, and let's have a look at some of the features. So we have a fragrance dispenser here. I believe there are three different fragrances that can be put in here and that can be dispensed out. We have a wireless charging point. We have cup holders. Inside here we have a cubby holder with um, two USB ports and a 12 volt outlet. One important point is actually the headrest. This is actually can be moved. It's not so much on the front seat, but a lot on the back seat. But even on the front seat here, we have some movability to give cushioning for the head. We're driving in the suburbs of Beijing on a fairly free flowing stretch of highway. It's not too congested today. Now we're driving the top of the range 600p version of the P5. This is the one with LiDAR equipped, but currently we cannot actually test out the functions like City NGP because those actually haven't come online. Now, there's a clue in the name 600p as to the range of this car. So under the NEDC cycle, it does 600 kilometers. There are two other versions, one that does 460 and 550 kilometers. So those are 285 miles, 342 miles and 373 miles, if I'm not mistaken. So you've got two different battery technologies in use. With the lower one, with the um, 460 kilometer range, it uses the um, lithium ion battery, whereas the other two use a NCM chemistry. So that's nickel, cadmium, and manganese um, chemistry. I believe this car has a 71.4 kilowatt hour battery. And it has a motor on the front wheels only, unlike the P7, which is a rear wheel drive, this is front wheel drive, and there is no four wheel drive option. And it has a 155 kilowatt motor, which is 208 horsepower. And it has 310 Newton meters of torque. Handling wise, we've driven this car on a variety of roads, um, expressways, highways, and we've even gone on winding roads actually in quite a countryside area. And I must say the car actually handles pretty well. I'm quite impressed. The steering is reasonably responsive. It's got a nice feel about it. Um, in fact, I would say it's actually better in that respect, perhaps, than the P7. The P7, I do feel, is a little bit on the loose side. I feel it's been tightened up a little bit with the car, although the handling is not as good as the P7. I mean, obviously, the P7 platform is more designed as a sporty platform and it's rear-wheel drive, etc. But general steering feel is possibly better in this car. Acceleration wise, we've got 7.5 seconds, zero to 100 kilometers an hour. So that's zero to 62 miles per hour. Okay, that's not hugely fast by electric car standards, but for most drivers, that is going to be fast enough. Charging wise, well, 
you can get 30 to 80 percent in I believe 38 minutes with this battery under the fastest charging conditions which is by modern standards perhaps not that great for example the Ionic 5 will do 10 percent to 80 percent in 18 minutes but that's got 800 volt architecture behind it so one thing this car has is V2L vehicle to load so you can actually run an electrical device off the battery from the car. So for example, you went camping, you might be able to run an electric stove. You also have a projector in this car as an optional extra, and that obviously runs off the battery of the car. So that is obviously very different to V2G, so vehicle to grid. So you cannot use the car as a backup if, you're, um, if the electricity goes off at your place or um, using it as a way of trading electricity or anything like that. Today, we've driven the car under various conditions. We've even taken this off-road, which often I won't even do with an SUV. But you'll probably notice there's one thing I haven't actually told you so far, and that's the price. Well, pre-sale prices are 160,000 RMB to 230,000. So this top of the range is 230,000. In US dollars terms, that is 24,800 to 35,600. So this is not exactly cheap, but it offers extremely good value for money, when it, especially when you factor in that this is the first production car with LiDAR. Most of the cars that we're hearing about with LiDAR are significantly more expensive. This though is a crucial car for Xpeng. Xpeng hope that this is really gonna boost um, sales, monthly sales figures up. So there's a competition happening in China currently for which of the smart EV companies is gonna be the first to cross the 10,000 a month barrier. It's close at the moment. When, when deliveries of this car begin in October, Xpeng will almost certainly cross that barrier. And in fact, Xpeng are talking about sales of 15,000 a month by the end of the year. Not of this model, but 15,000 across the three models. Xpeng, though, have got very ambitious plans over the next few years. So starting in 2023, they plan to have two or three models, two or three new models, I should say, coming onto the market each year. So this is the third model. Perhaps we're gonna see the fourth model in two months time at the Guangzhou Auto Show, and then it will go on sale next year. We may well see at least another model some, at some point next year. So Xpeng is certainly have big plans, and we can expect to see production figures really ramping up over the next year.